Well, we're still talking about how we would work with different sorts of visual representations of data. And uh, the last screencast, I was uh, just starting to talk about some of the ways that data is visually represented in the media. Um, there's, a, there's a newspaper in the United States called USA Today, which is kind of well known for these uh, infographics where they display different sorts of statistics in some sort of visually jarring way as you can as you can see here um, and there it's always easy to point out problems with these or, or to ask questions about these uh, so for example on this one the the idea is what's causing stress and uh, they're telling you the source the national consumers or consumers league that's misspelling on their part the national consumers league about what's causing stress 70 percent say fi family finances 58 percent lack of sleep 41 percent demands on the job the first thing that i think of is uh what what are we talking about in terms of whoops in terms of stress uh what exactly is the definition of stress for them um, and then this is certainly not a, uh, they're not making a causal argument here. They're, they're actually getting the opinions. This is a public opinion survey. Um, and that isn't completely clear, I don't think, from this infographic. The other thing is if you were to add these up, these do not equal 100%. So there's clearly some overlap. In other words, people were able to respond uh, in more than one category. Maybe the family finances, lack of sleep, and demands on the job were all affecting 41% of the people in each of these categories, right? But then there was an additional 17% that said lack of sleep, and then on top of that, there was an additional, what is that, 12% uh, that said 70 uh, that said family resources. We don't really know, and, and that's unfortunate because it, it doesn't give us as much information as we perhaps would like or need. So we just need to be careful about how we visually represent. Sometimes we want to collapse our variables. In other words, we want to take uh, a, a, a variable and look at the values that are there and squish them together in a way that we have uh, fewer choices for uh, either the respondents to respond to if we're giving a survey, or if we all already have the data, we want to collapse the, the, the variables values in a way that makes sense for our research question or objectives. We want to try to establish categories that are, of course, collectively exhaustive and mutually exclusive to make sure that we are um, not overlapping and that we are considering all of the possible options. We don't want to collapse the variable so much that we obscure important patterns in the distribution. For example, five, six, seven categories, if you're going to collapse them like that, is a good rule of thumb. It's a good uh, sort of standard to stick with. And then we want to use culturally defined categories as much as possible. And that's usually culturally defined by the culture of the researcher as well as the culture of the participants in the research. So let's take a look at some other ideas. We we'll want to keep our categories of interval and ratio variables the same width. So we might have, this is when you have uh, original data that's already collected. It was an interval or a ratio variable, let's say temperature, right? Let's say temperature in Fahrenheit. We just want to make sure that when we collapse, we have the same width. So, so maybe in the original data, it goes one degree, two degree, three degree, four degree, five degree, you know, whatever. Um, when we collapse, we'll do 1 to 5, and then we'll do 6 to 10, and then we'll do 11 to 15. You know what I'm saying? So we want to make sure that all of them are the same uh, width. These are each uh, five. There are five possible answers in each of these categories. All right. We want to follow cultural conventions by creating category widths divisible by powers of 10, generally. So I just gave uh, divisible by powers of 5. Um, let's do it by 10. 1 to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 30, and you see how that goes. We want to establish categories with fairly equal numbers of cases in them if possible. Again, this is if you already have the data and you know that the data might be bunched up on the low end of scores or whatever the scale is. Right? So, uh, and I'm just using that as an example. So you'd want to make sure that you were dividing it into categories that would not leave some categories empty. 
So let's take a look at this variable and its values. This is the data. We have the students' names. We have the number of times they use the computer each day. Um, this is probably a response to a survey question, or I suppose someone could have watched them all day and, and observed and counted it. If we wanted to collapse this variable for computer use, and we're collapsing the values, right, these are the values, into categories, how do we collapse this into categories that makes sense? Well, one way to do it is I, I've collapsed it here into uh, units of 25. 0 to 25, 26 to 50, 51 to 75, 76 to 100. Right? Uh, one of the issues with this is that we have a category here that's empty. So I didn't do a very good job of making sure that there was a balance among the categories. But the data might have been so skewed that that made it impossible. You could do it in uh, much smaller categories and spread it out more. This is in uh, roughly uh, uh, um, categories of 10. And then we have a, sort of a more even spread, although it's still bunched up here at the low end. We also have to remember to, that sometimes we need to deal with missing data. And these will be these sorts of responses generally when, when people are at how many times per day did you use the computer? I don't know, or I just won't answer, or I refuse to answer, or I'm not going to have an opinion on that, etc., etc. And so we have to make sure that when we're, when we're thinking about the data, we're not uh, ignoring this because this is still data. Right? So in these categories, maybe zero uh, would, would account for some of that missing data. But maybe there, is, there are you know, 18 that are 0 to 25 here, but there are 50 who just don't know, and so they didn't answer. Well, that 50 is potentially more than the frequency of those who did answer. So we have to make sure that we're always keeping track of the missing data so we can recognize when our, when our variable might be a little bit compromised. We also can think about subsets of cases. A subset is a set of cases selected for analysis based on their scores on some particular value variable. So we want to think when we're identifying subsets of cases, why is this subset important enough to isolate? And some of those subsets might be gender or race or income. So when we're looking at our number of times we use the computer each day, would it be interesting if instead of just counting up everybody, we separated it into uh, you know, racial categories, or we separated it into gender categories, or we separated it into income or SES categories. Maybe that would tell us something that we wanted to know. All right, let's think about how then we can translate some of this data into a visual representation. So the effects of levels of measurement on the use of cumulative distributions and the choice of pie charts and bar graphs. Uh, frequency and percentage distributions can be displayed visually in pie charts and bar graphs. Pie charts are especially helpful for nominal or dichotomous ordinal variables. Bar graphs are particularly useful for ordinal or interval and ratio variables and for nominal variables with more than nine values. So let's take a look at an example. Here we have a pie chart. Remember nominal or dichotomous ordinal. Is this nominal variable? The year? Is this nominal or is it dichotomous ordinal? Well dichotomous means that there are two choices. It's dichotomized. Right? So into one half and the other half. Um, that's not what we see here. We do, however, have this variable year, and then we have senior, junior, sophomore, and freshman, which are nominal, because these are names. And so we've used a bar, I'm sorry, a pie chart. We've used a pie chart to represent that data, and we simply divided it down by percentage. What percentage of freshmen, senior, junior, sophomore? And we took that from a previous table that we developed in a screencast earlier. Or we could use a bar graph. It's for ordinal, interval ratio, or nominal variables with nine plus values. Is computer use 
ordinal, interval ratio, or nominal with nine plus values. Well, let's look at what we have here. We have the number of times that, that um, students report using the computer each day. We have categories for the actual frequency. They're divided into uh, roughly 10 different times per category. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 is, is 10 options. Is this ordinal? Well, when we break it into categories, it is. Right? Because any answer in here could be 0 through 9. And we don't know if it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We also don't know if the answers in here are 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So the difference between this and this is hard to tell. It's got a range of roughly 20, but it could be as small as 1, the difference between 9 and 10. So this, the way it's laid out in categories, is ordinal. But if we just had it as frequencies, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and on, then we'd be talking about interval ratio. This is not nominal. We also have to be concerned with outliers when we're visually representing data. Outliers are simply scores on an interval ratio variable that stand alone as unusually high or unusually low. They're usually isolated at the end of the distribution or somehow remote from most of the other scores. And sometimes we will exclude outliers from statistical analyses, but not always. So for example, if we were doing uh, an analysis of age and income, as you get older, this way, your income generally goes up. So if we were to plot things, each of these points would represent an individual person's age, like here, so for this one, age and income, and then for this one, age and income, right? So we're just a bunch of different uh, data represented here. And if we wanted to, we could plot a line that roughly fits the data. This is a positive relationship. As age increases, so does income. But let's say there's somebody down here. That is way off of the, uh, the plotted line, the regression line, right? the central tendency of the data. This is an outlier, someone who's older but makes an extremely low income when everyone else seems to be generally bunched in this area. Outlier. If we were to look at some actual reported data, this is influences on reading scores um, for per capita GDP and parental attainment in some of these, uh, some different countries, um, there seems to be a consistent outlier here. Can you guess which country that is? If you guessed Mexico, you were correct. Because Mexico sits down here at the bottom in both cases with it being very low on GDP per capita and very low on parental attainment and very low on reading scores, whereas most of the countries are around this regression line. So why do outliers occur? Well, it could be a mistaken measurement. Maybe there was just something wrong with the way that we were measuring the data for Mexico. Or it could be a mistake in the data preparation. After we collected the data, somebody typed in the wrong number on a spreadsheet. Sounds silly, but it happens. What well, might be more likely, especially since we see Mexico consistently occurring as an outlier in that data, is that there's some usual process that happens in Mexico that doesn't happen in other countries. And this is something that we simply don't know about. We haven't accounted for it somehow. It could also be a fluke or an unusual occurrence without any special theoretical implications. Although in our example here with Mexico, I'm more likely to go with the occurrences of, of usual processes that are unique to Mexico. And then finally, if we think about uh, maps of ecological variables, we can display spatial patterns of ecological variables. It's very useful and it looks like this. We see it a lot. It's simply spatially representing the data. Hope this has been helpful. I'll see you in the next screencast.